Family and fellow soldiers, I'm the Professor, and this is the Moment of Truth. Recently, the Supreme Court refused to hear any cases regarding the laws that have been passed in several states, particularly in the South, prohibiting any companies who support boycotting Israel from having government contracts with those states. Now, the law in particular that they refused to hear was from Arkansas, and that law required anyone wanting to do business with that state to first have to sign a pledge saying that they will never boycott Israel. And if you refuse to do so, then the state requires that you get paid 20% less for a contract. It's essentially a protest Israel tax. Now, originally those laws prohibited people from being able to do business with the state, but the Republicans eventually figured out that they violated the First Amendment with that one, so they instead changed the law, and the ACLU has gone to bat to try to get it struck down, and while the initial appeals did block this patently unconstitutional law, we see that the higher federal courts are doing their job now, which is rubber stamping whatever policy white power wants, laws be damned. It just seems so random, doesn't it? Why is it that there are a number of states that are saying that there's one country in particular that they don't want anyone boycotting or even saying that they should boycott? And by the way, will someone ask Ben Shapiro and other self-proclaimed free speech advocates why none of them dares to speak out on this? Will any of them accuse the Israeli lobby of being oversensitive? Will they talk about cancel culture, government overreach, or say that people need to stop objecting to anything that offends them? Of course not. Everyone understands that when these two-bit white supremacists say freedom of speech, all that means is be racist against black people, but no one's allowed to say that you are. Now, I personally have no burning desire necessarily when it comes to government contracts with any sort of state, but I do think that this issue in particular provides an interesting case study as to how the government decides whose issues that it's going to promote and which ones it's going to ignore. I told you years ago about an Al Jazeera documentary called The Lobby USA, which dealt with the Israeli lobby and how it influences U.S. policy. But part of the documentary dealt with how elements from the Israeli government worked to change U.S. laws so as to incentivize states to target people who were even critical of Israel, like college students, for example. The main target of the Israeli government's actions was the so-called BDS movement. That means Boycott, Divest, and Sanction. BDS is a movement based entirely on what black Americans did against the South African apartheid regime back in the 80s, which was to target them financially. And of course, what makes BDS so effective is it's not merely about what the people protesting this or that entity are doing. It's about them putting pressure on everyone else to join them. Now, in the case of South Africa back in the 80s, it was done to undermine the financial and political support for the Dutch occupation regime, and it ultimately led to its collapse. And now the Palestinians are copying our playbook, and they're using it against the Israeli government, and apparently has had more than a little impact. And this has made a whole lot of people from that government in particular very nervous, particularly AIPAC, the so-called American-Israeli Political Action Committee. Now, why does AIPAC in particular have so much stroke on Capitol Hill, especially with the Republicans? Well, it's not just about votes. The Jewish American vote is small, and what there is goes overwhelmingly to the Democrats. So why are Republicans the biggest supporters of AIPAC then? Because AIPAC told them that if they vote the right way, they'll get campaign donations. But it didn't stop there. The Israeli lobby also began a campaign of whining and dining American politicians. AIPAC would pay to have congressmen and other opinion makers taken on lavish trips to Israel. According to The Intercept, AIPAC has been taking politicians on these little vacations since at least the early 1990s. According to The Intercept, the cost for these trips averages out to about $10,000 per person. The key term there being per person, because the Israelis allow the congressman to bring one family member with them. $10,000 per person. But that's what The Intercept said. The Washington Post, on the other hand, wrote one lonely little article about this same thing eight years ago. That time, they were reporting on 58 members of Congress who AIPAC took on vacation to Israel. They didn't have any figures on how much AIPAC spent for that group in particular, though the Washington Post did report that two years earlier, AIPAC had spent a million dollars to take a group of 60 congressmen on vacation to Israel and that it averaged out to $18,000 per member. 
So the Intercept's figure, although more recent, was modest compared to other trips that APAC has paid for. Now, of course, we all know that it didn't cost Israel's lobbyists $18,000 just to fly these crooked congressmen to Israel and put them up even in the swankiest hotel. What could they possibly show these congressmen or tell them that was so important that they had to go and fly 40 to 50 to 60 of them all the way to the other side of the planet? And they also invited, quote unquote, opinion makers to come along as well. Well, obviously, the goal is to get everybody on the same page. No federal or state law enforcement or activists who were there. No pesky reporters from rival publications. This wasn't a vacation. It was a bubble. There's a lot that we don't know about what all goes on with these little shindigs that APAC pays for. But whatever that money goes to, there's nothing honest about it. Now, exactly a year ago was when the latest APAC-funded vacation took place. You heard nothing about it in the white American media, though the Israeli media talked about it. This time, over 40 members of Congress went to Israel, presumably with their family members. And it's very interesting because people will say that the Israeli government paid for this themselves, but when you consider how much the U.S. government gives in foreign aid to Israel, it's far more likely that the money used to fund those trips actually came from the same members of Congress who were benefiting from it. Talk about bribing you with your own money. And it is a bribe, by the way. Cornell University's own website defines bribery as the transfer of value in exchange for official action, and that it refers to the offering, giving, soliciting, or receiving of any item of value as a means of influencing the actions of an individual holding a public or legal duty. The operative term there being any item of value doesn't say money. It says any item of value. Offering federal lawmakers an all-expenses-paid vacation to Israel for them and at least one family member, which means spouse, that's a bribe. Because although Israel is beachfront property, nobody goes there to surf. The reason they're going there is so that they can be wined and dined and most likely given cash. All of this luxurious treatment, and Lord knows what else, isn't being done as charity. The Israeli lobby is doing it with the full expectation that those members of Congress will pay it back through policy, especially when it comes time to talk about foreign aid. And although AIPAC does give more money to the Republicans than the Democrats, when you look at who it is who actually goes on these little vacations, you see that it's a bipartisan delegation. Even when the Democrats control the House and the Senate, the policy doesn't change. There's complete continuity of policy where the lobby in Israel is concerned. And this gives us a look at why. Just look at who's in attendance among the Democrats. Failed Democratic Party leader Debbie Wasserman Schultz. But way over on the left, we see Richie Torres. He's the guy in the dark suit with the purple tie. Torres, you might recall, was lauded as the first gay Afro-Latino to get into Congress when he won office in 2020. I don't know how many trips he's made to do anything for black people back in New York, but he's got plenty of time to go to the other side of the world for a vacation paid for by foreign lobbyists. And who is that other slimy politician furthest to the left who's just cheesing to beat the band? Why, it's Hakeem Jeffries. This was last year, mind you, several months before Nancy Pelosi announced that she was going to be retiring, but it just goes to show that this guy was already being groomed and making his bones and pledging to get tangibles for everyone except us. And not for nothing, but he is now minority leader Hakeem Jeffries. So if and when the Democrats manage to get back control of the House of Representatives, Hakeem Jeffries is going to be the one leading them. He's going to be Speaker of the House. And apparently he's going to be the guy who's leading the Democrats into the future, though he himself appears to be led around by the nose. By the way, did you know that minority leader Hakeem Jeffries is also the nephew of Dr. Leonard Jeffries? Yes, that Leonard Jeffries, one of the leading advocates and academics of Pan-Africanism. Well, the apple sure fell far from the tree on that one, didn't it? I can't recall Dr. Jeffries taking his nephew to task, but if he did, it sure wasn't very effective. Black people put Hakeem Jeffries into office, same way that they put Richie Torres in office. But how much money have these two secured for black people? How many times have they made group appearances for black people? See, this is why your congressional black talkers don't do anything for black folks. As they see it, they're plugged into a political machine, and it gives them all kinds of perks and benefits and goodies that have nothing to do with being black. 
Their job is not to produce for their constituents. Their job is to produce for themselves and don't rock the boat. As they see it, they've transcended being black. They've escaped their skin color. So on the few occasions when they actually lowered themselves to talk about black people, they always do it with the same amount of condescension and the same amount of distance as the average white liberal. So the Israelis have plied the members of Congress with luxurious getaways for them and their spouses, but do you think that any of black people's interests come up during these get-togethers? See, whenever black people discuss things, we always include everyone else. We include immigrants, the LGBT community, feminists, everyone. Yet when other groups have meetings, they don't mention us at all. Well, actually, that's not entirely accurate. There are groups who do mention us when they have their private get-togethers, but in many cases, it's not to say anything good. Israel's diplomats may be trying to challenge the apartheid label by canvassing support amongst African Americans. The major problem of Israel is with the young generation of the black community. Black Lives Matter starts there. Now, the point of this morning's briefing is to give you a glimpse into how far this racist country's governments at the state and federal levels are willing to go to provide driver's licenses and financial aid for illegal aliens and to write laws meant to prevent people from criticizing a foreign government. They'll bend over backwards to do things for people who aren't even citizens, to do things for foreign countries, but they'll tie themselves in knots to not do anything for black folks right here at home. When it comes to all these other groups, we never get the lecture about how it's impossible, can't be done, it's not feasible, as Bernie Sanders said about reparations. This is all about race. Billions for Ukraine or Israel, hundreds of millions for illegal immigrants, laws across the country to prevent people from even speaking about foreign countries. But absolutely nothing for the black people who built this one. Next time the white media or Hakeem Jeffries decides to lecture black people about how we've got to do for this or that other group, you make sure to remind them that black people have done the most to build the wealth that gets sent overseas. The wealth that enables the Hakeem Jeffries and others to go have their luxurious, lavish vacations on the other side of the world. All that wealth that goes to everyone else except for us, except for the people who generated it. And if the Hakeem Jeffries and his pals are betting that black people will never be in a position to hold them accountable for what they've denied us, they're wrong. People like Hakeem Jeffries are part of the problem. If and when we get enough of us on code and get our political game in order, one of the first orders of business will be to make sure Hakeem Jeffries and Richie Torres and the rest of these do-nothing chumps will have all the time in the world to go to Israel or anywhere else they want on vacation, full-time. Because they won't be misrepresenting us anymore or ever again. Good day and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Morris Bodden, Jimmy Whitfield, Faith Speaks Life, Isaac, and Jordan Inslee. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black Empowerment only exists because of you.